I'd like to thank uh, Jean-Philippe, uh, Steve, Jonathan, and all the organizers for the invitation to come to this beautiful place. As predicted earlier this morning, I, I will also claim that I have a fruit fly to study uh, strongly correlated systems. Uh, my particular fruit fly uh, lives in a very isolated system because uh, with cold atoms in a trap, we're very effectively isolate them from decoherence by coupling them to the environment, and therefore we can watch their dynamics evolve uh, at a time scale where the quantum dynamics happens faster than the decoherence and coupling to the environment. And not only from that kind of top-down perspective do we have a nice system, but from the bottom up we can uh, see individual atoms. Each of these dots here is a, is a single atom in our experiment. And uh, we're able to tune the interactions, and that will be really one of the main themes of my talk, of how that is done. So uh, I'm going to tell you about a few experiments where we take these cold fermions, we tune their interactions, uh, we initialize them in some interesting state, and then let them go and watch those uh, many-body quantum dynamics evolve, and then see what we've learned. And uh, what's, what's exciting is that uh, we pretty quickly come upon some open questions and some uh, some mysteries, some of which I have solutions for, and others I'll just note as unsolved. So interactions between neutral fermions, uh, when they're cold enough, can be broken down into partial waves. These are short-range interacting systems because they are uh, they don't have a charge; they don't have a long-range interaction. So uh, with different spin states, uh, fermions allow, are allowed to have a spin singlet interaction. And, uh, and, and interact in the S-wave channel. If there's been polarized, they might be able to interact in a P-wave channel where the exchange symmetry is taken care of by the orbital wave function. However, there is a centrifugal barrier for two massive particles coming together. And this barrier for typical uh, neutral atoms is about a millikelvin, which is about a thousand times larger than the typical microkelvin collision energies. And therefore, almost all cold atom physics you ever see is just S-wave scattering, uh, essentially because anything in, in higher orbital length of momenta, odd or even, just L greater than zero, will just reflect off of the centrifugal barrier, which means they don't interact. On the other hand, you can make a different argument, which is that what if I spin polarize my gas? Now, S-wave interactions are forbidden uh, by exchange symmetry. So you might say, oh, well, then we must have only P wave scattering, or maybe it's just a non interacting gas. In fact, we can choose between these scenarios because, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field for correctly chosen states, uh, we can either choose to resonantly enhance the P waves or resonantly enhance the S waves. We do this for, with a mechanism called a Feshbach resonance, which I won't have time to, to explain today. But let me show you what, what this does. Uh, for S waves, for instance, uh, here's some data from Rice University, uh, from Randy Hewlett's lab. And I'm showing you on the vertical axis the scattering length, the length which characterizes S wave scattering versus magnetic field in Gauss. So this is easily accessible with uh, a coil with current running through it. And, and now the scattering length is in bore here from uh, 10 to minus 2 to maybe uh, over 10 to 5 bore. So that's seven orders of magnitude in scattering length. And then if you remember, scattering goes like uh, the, cross, the cross section for scattering goes like the scattering length squared. This is 14 orders of magnitude in cross section tuned by one knob in the lab, in the same sample. So uh, what's perhaps most interesting is going to where these interactions are very strong. Uh, in that case, the, the phase acquired by this quantum scattering event is pi over two. That's the strongest cross-section you can have, the strongest interaction you can have. And uh, this is called unitarity. So this is a, a cross-section limited by conservation of probability current. So a natural question to ask then is, I can tune these few-body interactions. What does the many-body physics do? And uh, an interesting way to phrase that is to use the mechanism of thermodynamics and say, OK, I now have a new knob. I can not only tune something like volume, that's a normal thermodynamic knob we have, we push on things, uh, but we can also tune now the scattering thing. And uh, just like volume has pressure as a thermodynamic conjugate, uh, if I tune a scattering length, then what is the thermodynamic conjugate to that? 
And the answer is something that uh, is called the contact. And probably uh, very few of you have heard of the contact. Who has heard of the contact? Who's curious? OK. Yeah. So um, it's funny that, that uh, something that's so simple uh, seems so unknown. But it's actually, since about 2005, taken a very central place in the study of ultra-cold atoms because it's almost easier for us to tune the scattering length than it is to change the volume of our box. So at first, you might think there's nothing special. Every external knob has a conjugate variable. But the contact is at the center of a set of universal relations, which not only uh, are contained in thermodynamics, but also have a lot of microscopic implications. So if you know what this one value is, the contact, you can say something about the two-body density matrix, about correlations, about how many pairs there are in the gas. You can see the contact in uh, momentum distributions and in spectroscopy, et cetera. So the tie between these microscopic and macroscopic properties is something that isn't available for pressure or other uh, thermodynamic variables. It shows you there's more happening here than just thermodynamics. And uh, here are some first observations of the contact in four different labs around the world. And even though these four labs labeled the vertical axis of their plots differently, it's essentially four different measurements on four different observables of the same single unknown in the mini body problem called the contact. So what is the contact? Is it inscrutable like this John Chamberlain <laughs> uh, thing that I saw the other day? <laughs> it's not that inscrutable, actually. So, uh, think about what a reduced density matrix will look like in a mini-body system. And here talking about a two-body density matrix, so something where this is the probability of having a particle at R1 and a particle at R2. If these two particles are close enough, uh, then, uh, it, and what I mean by close enough, closer than the inner particle spacing, which is somewhere out here, say hundreds of nanometers in a cold gas, uh, up to the inner particle interaction, which is something like a nanometer, then the form of this two-body density matrix is completely determined by two-body physics. What it looks like, the wiggles and nodes and the wave function are just, it's just a two-body quantity. But the thing you don't know is how many of them are that close. In other words, uh, how correlated, how strong that nearby correlation is. So the form of this density matrix at short range is, is set by the two-body physics, but the normalization is unknown and is determined by the many-body physics. Think of the many-body physics as kind of a collider that's throwing pairs together, and you need to know something about that many-body state to know how many pairs are thrown together. So the normalization of this uh, at short range is the contact. So if I take a full density matrix, uh, my apology for the equations, this is something for the theorists, uh, uh, if you take the full density matrix and you trace over the third particle out to the nth particle, you get this two-body density matrix. And this two-body density matrix is a Hermitian thing, so you can diagonalize it. And, and so the diagonal elements here, the eigenvalues of the two-body density matrix, um, are, contain all of the many-body physics. So the contact is essentially projecting these uh, eigenvectors onto the scattering wave function. And, and you, so the C value that I keep showing you is mathematically the sum over all the eigenvalues of the two-body density matrix times some kind of projection coefficients onto the scattering, uh, onto the scattering wave function. Okay. So encapsulated in the contact is a whole bunch of mini-body physics. And I don't get to determine what these individual things are, but if I sum them all up, I get a single scalar quantity of the contact. Okay. So now how does that determine observables, uh, if you now know what the two-body density matrix is, and you know what, uh, how interactions scale with inner particle spacing, then you can figure out what the interaction energy is. And so uh, the contact just factors out of the two-body interaction Hamiltonian. And therefore, uh, if, you, if you now ch ask, how does the interaction energy change when I change something about the interaction strength, like the scattering length, then uh, you get this, that this energy changing with the scattering length is just the contact. So the slope 
of energy in thermodynamic data tells you the content. Another way to measure that is to look at the momentum distribution. And, uh, and so if you, again, if you know something about the two-body density matrix, you can Fourier transform it, figure out what the momentum distribution is, and you find that the high energy tail goes like one over k to the fourth, where k is the momentum. And so here's some data uh, where that probability, this is data from Jilla, was scaled by uh, momentum to the fourth. And at low energy, it does something that uh, has to do with the Fermi distribution and the many body physics at, uh, determining the momentum distribution. But at high momentum, it asymptotes to this one over k to the fourth. So there, again, is a place to read off the contact. And a third place, which is what I'm going to tell you about, is what if I look at spin flip spectroscopy? If I have a gas and I see how easy it is to flip one of these fermions into an unoccupied internal state, uh, again, you can go through this math and show that uh, the contact can be read off of these kind of spectra by looking out here at the high energy tail, where this spin flip energy is several Fermi energy above the one single particle residence. And that tail should go like 1 over uh, this RF detuning to the 3 halves power. And so when you see this characteristic power law in the data, you fit it with a 1 over omega to 3 halves, and you have a contact. So these three observables are uh, examples from different labs in the world of measuring something about the many body physics from uh, either single particle spectra or thermodynamic data, and these are all uh, telling you about correlations in the gas. Okay, so with that introduction, let me tell you a little bit about some dynamics experiments. What we're able to do is to uh, tune the interaction strength with the Feshbach resonance, set some kind of initial polarization in the Fermi gas, uh, control whether or not there is a field gradient around then we allow the system to evolve and, and watch it. Uh, during that evolution, maybe we can play with the uh, magnetic degrees of freedom with NMR type spin pulses. And then finally, we'll measure uh, either correlations with our spectroscopy using the contact theory I just told you about, it, or with Ramsey interferometry, we can look at the magnetization versus time. So these experiments are going on in, in an optical trap kind of like crossing two optical tweezers and at their intersection you have a little harmonic trap for neutral atoms and they sit right above a, an atom chip and this chip is useful for fast RF manipulation and spin flips between the states. Potassium 40, the neutral fermion we're using, has 18 stable ground states but we can spin polarize it so you can forget about most of those and instead we'll use just the lowest couple of spin states as a pseudo spin one half system, so it looks kind of like electrons. But when doing spectroscopy, we'll often flip to this third unoccupied state. So now we can do this kind of contact spectroscopy, except change the time interval between the initialization of the gas and when we do the spectroscopy. And then we change, in that spectroscopy pulse, we, of course, do change omega, the detuning from uh, a single spin flip, and that's how we follow the correlations in the gas versus time. So here's the kind of thing we see. Uh, and it, each of these slices here is a spectrum, and going into the field of view is time. And I want to draw your attention not to this peak here, but to this plateau. And this is the spin flip rate scaled by uh, frequency to three halves. So the plateau that you observe is the contact. So this is the correlation developing in the gas. So if I take uh, a fit you know, to just what this asymptote is, the contact rises as a function of time, and after a few milliseconds comes to a steady state of some value, which tells you about uh, S-wave correlations. Now, why does it take about two milliseconds, one or two milliseconds, for this, these correlations to develop? The reason is because we start in this experiment with a spin order gas, and uh, that spin order is slowly twisted up by a, a magnetic field gradient, which was at first accidentally present, and then we intentionally started playing with that gradient. 
And so if you have a spin texture in the gas, and these are itinerant particles able to move around, the obvious thing that might happen is they start walking around and mixing up. And so what starts as a locally spin polarized gas, eventually, due to spin diffusion, becomes an unpolarized gas. Once the gas is unpolarized, then you're able to have S-wave scattering because you need two different spin states in order to make a spin signal. So what this kind of time evolution is telling you is that uh, there's a global relaxation of a spin ordering. And it's slower and slower as we turn up the directions <laughs> Because as local equilibrium, local damping of spin currents become faster due to stronger scattering, then global relaxation is slower. So uh, if I average over the whole gas, then what you might draw is a block sphere, where this is spin up and this is spin down. And uh, if we start, say, with uh, something with a, a transverse polarization, it, it would, in a magnetic field, process around uh, this, this block sphere. Uh, but still, it's fully polarized. But now, if the sample decoheres, uh, this, the block vector shrinks in length, and eventually it's just a dot in the middle of the block sphere. And that corresponds to an unpolarized sample. So as a function of time, we're going from an ideal Fermi gas to a unitary Fermi gas, in a way going from uh, an uncorrelated to a strongly correlated state just as a function of time, and we can follow these correlations. So we observed this in the, in the lab, but still hadn't understood the spin diffusion picture. And the real clue to, to understand that this was spin diffusion and, and transport relaxing the system was that we could modify the way the correlations rose as a function of time by using different uh, pulse sequences. <laughs> So we could uh, let the gas, the, the gas started to depolarize, and then if you put a, a spin reversal pulse on, it would start to slow down its correlation increase and then, uh, and then start, start up again. And essentially what was happening is there was a spin spiral developing, and when the spin spiral didn't have a gradient anymore, it didn't drive spin currents anymore. So we studied this, uh, and uh, in the following way, uh, now not looking at spectroscopy, we kind of went back to an old idea from uh, Hahn. In the first paper of spin echoes, Hahn did this in water, okay, in a magnetic field gradient, uh, created a spin superposition, allowed uh, water to diffuse, and uh, then watched how the magnetization would decay as a function of time. And by following this kind of spin echo sequence, Everything that is static uh, can be undone by the spin reversal, but everything that's transport related and not time reversed by a pulse sequence is not undone. And so as a function of time, you see magnetization decay, and you can follow what this transverse magnetization is doing and give uh, a value for diffusivity. So in fact, we found that the diffusivity achieved a fairly low value. Uh, it achieved something that's discussed uh, as the Planck limit. And let me try to say what this, this is. Diffusivity might go like uh, density times the, the uh, transport lifetime divided by susceptibility and mass. And uh, you kind of follow this, these kind of arguments, these hand-waving arguments, and you say that a quasi-particle must have a lifetime which is greater than or equal to h bar over its energy. And you come upon the, the argument that diffusivity should be greater than h bar over m. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit of a, an argument which lacks self-consistency, because once diffusivity is equal to h bar over m, then the quasi-particle is really no longer well-defined. It has a, a lifetime that's too short uh, for you to really be talking about quasi-particles anymore. But uh, a lot of people have, have thought about this problem, and it seems that this this Planck limit seems to be obeyed also in materials. There's some work from the McKinsey group here um, about T linear resistivity, where if, if this is thought of as, as a really hard lower bound, then transport coefficients like diffusivity and conductivity should also have lower bounds. And if you look at spin transport measurements, this seems to be what is found in most labs. Uh, 
at, at MIT and, and in Toronto, we found that spin diffusivity in several modalities is never lower than h bar over m. Even if we crank the interactions all the way to unitarity, where these collisions are as strong as S-wave collisions could possibly be. The one outlier is that in two dimensions, uh, uh, in the Cole group at Cambridge at the time, they found something that was a thousand times lower. And so a kind of outstanding question in the field is, is this Planck bound somehow violated by spin transport in two dimensions? Uh, so far, we don't have any good theoretical explanations for why that might be so, and, uh, and, and nor, nor have these observations been reproduced, and we're working on that right now. Okay, so now let me switch gears. Uh, to discuss P waves. And this is a story which uh, is for the graduate students in the audience that uh, we've been working around the S wave resonance and doing spectroscopy. And, uh, and then my senior grad student uh, went away for a week and the junior grad student took over. And uh, I went down to the lab and said, Scott, how are things? And the terrible when I'm supposed to see a signal don't see a signal, and when I'm not supposed to see, see a signal, it's there. And I said, oh, well, are you sure it isn't just a mistake? He's like, no, no, I checked this. It's, this seems to be happening, but I must be doing something wrong. And why don't you go away and stop bothering <laughs> and come back later, and I'm sure this will be gone. But it wasn't. In fact, what, uh, what, what Chris, the senior student, did, knew and, and Scott didn't is that we should always avoid the P-wave resonance. And uh, you should avoid the P-wave resonance, goes conventional knowledge in the field, because it's very lossy, and, uh, and, and you don't want half of your atoms to go away. Uh, so, so essentially, we would take data around the S-wave resonance, but then we would always jump these values here and keep going to avoid the losses associated with this P-wave resonance. Well, uh, Scott didn't know that, and so he ended up just taking spectra there, and they were really interesting. Um, so of course, what's interesting about this P-wave resonance is that uh, you get spin triplet interactions in fermions, and furthermore, in potassium, we can even control the anisotropy of the P-wave interaction because the interactions along the magnetic field are resonant at a slightly different field value than the ones out of the plane of the magnetic fields. So we're able to tune both the strength and the anisotropy of those interactions. What is tuned by the magnetic field is something called the scattering volume. So you probably know something about the scattering length if you remember scattering in chapter seven of Sakurai. Uh, the, the, the phase of scattering is, is one over this scattering length. Well, P waves is kind of the same. There's, there's one over a constant, but this now has to have units of volume. And this is the thing which is tuned by the magnetic field. Okay, there's also another uh, parameter for scattering in the P wave channel which is an effective range, R. So V and R are the two parameters that map. And let me just <coughs> move forward in the interest of time. One thing that's very different about P waves is that if you go to the Feshbach resonance, to the field at which the scattering volume diverges, that's not P wave unitarity. So uh, you don't get a pi over two phase shift in those scattering channels. So there's something very different about P waves essentially because it's a narrow resonance. The, the energetic width of resonantly enhanced collisions is smaller than the Fermi energy in this gas. It's a, a narrow transition. So here's what we saw around the P-wave resonance. We took one of these spectra. Uh, this is the RF frequency, and here's where the single particle feature should be. And here's a tail that looks a lot like the contact we've been measuring for S-waves. But the scaling of this goes like one over frequency to the one half. And that's strange because it should be one over frequency to the three halves if you're looking at a contact. And so we didn't really understand that, but we took a lot of data at different fields. And it seems that especially close to the resonance, we would see this scaling. It turns out that what we were seeing was the P-wave contact, but the theory has to be elaborated because now we have two parameters we can vary. So uh, and thermodynamics would tell us that every time you have a parameter you can change, then it has a conjugate, kind of like volume to pressure. Except now we have two different volume-like things, so we have two different new pressure-like uh, thermodynamic conjugates. In each of those, we can now call a contact, and it's called this CV because it's uh, conjugate to the volume. The other one is CR, conjugate to this length. 
And, and then there are also three projections that an L equals one collision can have. So there are three M's for L equals zero, L equals one. Okay. So there are also contact relations, just like the ones uh, we knew already for S waves. Each of these tells you something about the gas, either thermodynamics, uh, a two-body density matrix, something about RF spectroscopy, something about the momentum distribution. Now the momentum distribution is anisotropic, so you have to include these kind of wild ends, but they all include uh, values of these new things, the contacts for P waves. So using the RF, spe the RF spectroscopy relations, we can take our data and fit it to a 1 over squared omega or 1 over omega 3 halves and then extract these two new uh, characterizations of P wave correlations in the gas. And so here they are. This is CV, the one conjugate to the scattering volume. This is CR. The Feshbach resonance occurs right here. And so only above the Feshbach resonance did we see a uh, significant contact um, and, and nothing below. So there's an anisotropy and asymmetry. And the reason they, they only go up to another value is that at this field value, we resonantly enhance zero energy collisions. And at this field value, we resonantly enhance collisions that have twice the Fermi energy in their center of mass frame. And that's the highest energy collisions you can have in a Fermi gas. Collisions that have twice the Fermi energy. And so beyond that, uh, no collisions are produced by the many body system that are resonantly enhanced. But between zero energy and 2EF, uh, there's significant P wave correlation. OK, so now we know all this. I mean, once you measure the contact using one method, you know the contact for all the other quantities that can be predicted uh, by the two body density matrix at short range. And, and so uh, it's, it's kind of a gift from the separation of link scales that you can measure something about something so simple as spin flip spectroscopy and know about two body correlations in the gas. Um, okay, so one thing you can do once you now have measured this contact is use these relations to, to figure out other things about the gas. So if we take our data, contact versus magnetic field, and now we integrate underneath it. We know from this kind of adiabatic relation that the contact is telling us how the free energy will change as we tune, tune the P wave scattering volume. So if I integrate both sides of the equation, I get the change in free energy due to interactions as I tune them closer and closer to resonance. So then what you would, how you would interpret this data is that the shift of free energy from an ideal gas, uh, as I come out from non-resonance towards the Feshbach resonance is that the free energy of the gas shifts down by about half a Fermi energy per particle, which is a tremendous interaction energy shift. So these are really strong P wave interactions. Um, now you can look at this kind of diagram now. It's easier to understand the integrated data than the raw contacts <coughs> and kind of slice it apart into several regimes. One where we have a very good signal and we have a strongly attractive P wave gas. Another one where the signal is very weak, but we still expect the inter interaction to be attractive. And then there's also a re weakly repulsive branch, but we never saw any strong contacts over there. Right at the resonance, these losses are then dominating. So losses were the reason that conventional wisdom in the field was not to look at P wave interactions. Um, in fact, there had been a lot of study of P waves uh, in, in all of these labs. So we really did not uh, discover or pioneer the idea of P wave Feshbach resonances. But all of these experiments uh, were just looking at how the gas died, essentially. Um, it, it dies on, on a kind of millisecond or 10 millisecond time scale, which in the parameters of these experiments was too slow to allow for global equilibrium. So it's too soon to look for myron and fermions here because we don't even have global thermal equilibrium. And there's no way we can have some beautiful long range uh, order in a P wave superfluid. So what we're really seeing is just a metal with strong P wave interactions. But uh, the surprise is there's enough time to see a strong correlation and a strong interaction develop. 
Um, probably what's happening is there are local interact, there are local uh, thermalized bubbles within a larger system. Um, and I, I can tell you more about this dynamics if, if you'd like, but let me uh, leave some room for discussion and, and, and conclude. The conclusion from this P wave part of the talk is that uh, there are P wave contacts, and this was really something that jumped out of us at the lab. Uh, once we had an unbiased experimentalist in front of the apparatus, and, and again, this is a message for graduate students, it doesn't matter if it's your first year in the lab, you can still change the research direction of your group, just make sure don't listen to your advisor. Uh, so uh, be because of the particular split resonance in potassium-40, uh, all of this data was measured, I didn't really emphasize that, but when there were red and blue points, we were measuring contacts for two different anisotropies. Uh, and um, as with S waves, you would expect this P wave contact theory to be quite general, to apply to any quantum statistics, dimensionality, or, 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 or state. And uh, a surprise was that the dynamical window of these correlations were, uh, was, was larger than expected. And uh, so uh, let me just say that, that these are the people responsible for the work. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, Scott is, is the graduate student who ignored everyone else and took Spectra anyway. Uh, Chris was the senior author who uh, trained Scott and did, <laughs> took a lot of the data step on the postdoc, and we have really strong theory collaborators uh, at HKU and Tsinghua. Thank you for your time. Can we can we do anything about them? Uh, it's predict so the the loss channel is that um, dimers, which are responsible for the Feshbach resonance, uh, do not have an infinite lifetime. They have a coupling to more deeply bound dimers, and so it essentially you can think of a Feshbach resonance as dressing uh, an atomic collision with a molecular uh, with a molecular dressing. And if that molecular channel had a loss, then as, as you increase the interaction strength, the, the entire system will have a loss. However, it's predicted that at low dimensionality, uh, the ratio of elastic to inelastic collisions gets better and better. So what we're doing right now is looking at uh, pancakes. And uh, if that doesn't work, we might look at tubes, because it might even be more uh, favorable. Um, Maybe though in the long term, there needs to be a better way to engineer orbital interactions. Um, and, and so there are, there are proposals about how to do that. But in this system, the only hope we have is going to lower dimensionality. So uh, you did a great job of explaining the contact. And in, in this context, it's kind of, the, in some hand wavy sense, the projection of the many body physics onto um, two body parameter. Um, if you go to an FMLOP re resonance where you have three body interactions, do you expect to have a three body like contact? Yes. And if so, is it measurable? Yes. So uh, Eric Broughton wrote a nice paper about this, about uh, three body contact in bosons. Uh, that exists because of FMLOP, because of FMLOP uh, resonances. For those that don't know, FMOF resonances are three particle states, three particle bound states that exist even in a regime where there are no two particle bound states. Um, and so, so for bosons, you should be able to see this uh, as a 1 over k to the fifth instead of 1 over k to the fourth scaling. Uh, Debbie Jin and collaborators looked and, had, and, and they haven't seen it. Um, it's also probably the case that in 2D fermions, there's a super FMOF related effect. Uh, but without those bound states, there isn't anything. For instance, in 3D fermions, there should be no three-body uh, FMOF states. Hey, uh, I just had a quick question about the, uh, the strength of your P-wave correlations. 
Uh, so first of all, what are you comparing their strength to? And um, second, it wasn't clear to me why they were so strong. Um, yeah, so let's see. Well, one way, okay, one way to, uh, one way to give a kind of absolute calibration on how strong the correlations are is to say, uh, what fraction of the gas would need to be in a, in a P wave pair in order to give this strength of correlation? Okay, so if it's 100% of the gas has to be at least at short range in a P wave pair, pairing state, then I think of that as as correlated as you can be. And, and that is the strength of correlation we observe near the resonance. So if you compare to a simple minded uh, theory where you say, what fraction of my gas is dimerized in the P-wave dimers, uh, it looks like 100%. Um, I don't believe the simple theory because it throws out anything but non-interacting dimers. So there could also be uh, interaction between those dimers and there could be there's a, there's a, a contribution from unpaired atoms. But uh, what, what's, what's interesting about the contact is that in order to take Data like uh, uh, here we go. Data like this. I don't have to have a model for the P waves metal. So this this correlation is measured uh, without having without choosing a model for how the P wave mini body physics occurs. Uh, and and so we can compare that to various models. But you know this is published without a theory curve on top of it because this is. Uh, this really just comes from looking at the tail of the RF spectrum and knowing what uh, the wave function must look like at short range. It's a nice benchmark. Now, I, now you know, different, different types of approaches to measuring, to, to predicting these correlations can be benchmarked against this. But uh, we haven't prejudiced any of these correlations with uh, the assumption that things are dimerized or the assumption that um, there's any particular state. So this discussion of the contact for the continuum case reminds me a bit of discussions for optical lattice systems of the fact that if you differentiate with respect to the Hubbard U, you get the average double occupancy. I wonder is that how strong is that analogy? Are, are there are there relations between the average double occupancy and other quantities in optical lattice systems that are analogous to the ones we have here between the contact and other observers? Yeah, I guess this is the uh, Feynman-Hellman theorem. So you have a Hamiltonian, you differentiate with respect to your parameter, you get the expect, you know, the you get the expectation uh, value, and so I think that's the, the the kind of conceptual connection between those two things. Um, and uh, I should say that even before the full contact theory was developed, people understood that about uh, interacting gases and especially the S-wave channel and and kind of had bits and pieces of what I call the full contact theory by Sheena Tan uh, beforehand. So I don't know if there's more to say about the lattices. Uh, I know that uh, Ivan Kostan has worked out some lattice contact relations, but I, uh, so I can, I can give you that reference that might answer some of those questions. Any, any questions? So, if not, let's uh, thank all the speakers again.